Welcome everybody to this uh, new and revamped FBA seminar series. We uh, have some wonderful speakers lined up for the next few months. And I'd like to thank John Murray Bly for kicking us off with this, this new seminar series uh, with his talk on constancy and change in river ecology. John is a national ecology advisor with the Environment Agency and has been an FBA fellow since 2018 and an FBA member since 1978, which is very impressive. Uh, John described himself as a river invertebrate ecologist and is going to talk to us about his career to date, including his involvement in river packs. So um, great. Thanks again, John, and take it away when you're ready. Right. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm um, I wasn't quite sure what to do for this uh, seminar, so I'm doing a number of things. Um, so as Louis said, I'll I'll do a slight uh, biographical introduction because that's what we've asked the new fellows. Um, to do so, it'll it'll give you some background to me. Um, also, um, because we've got the FBA staff um, uh, on this call as well, and the new fellows. Um, uh, the main theme is going to be around riv packs and and the work that I've been doing, and then after that, I'll um, have a look to the future as well. Um, so I'll just get a get a clock. Um, So for me, the very, um, I know when I first became interested in natural history, but it was a long time ago, um, helped along by drinking a lot of tea because in the 1960s, you used to get picture cards um, in packets of tea. And I used to collect these as a child. Um, and I think at school, we also had posters showing certainly the butterflies. And um, that got me into sort of identifying different things um, in a fairly easy way. Then when I went to prep school, my parents were living in the Far East at the time. I was sent away to boarding school. And one of the, I, I was always interested in natural history. I always did well at, uh, uh, in um, biology at school, but um, the lake and the background there, that is the place where I became fascinated by fresh water and freshwater invertebrates in particular. You know, on a on a Sunday afternoon, you could just pop down to the edge of the lake um, with a jam jar, look underneath lily pads, and instead of finding five or six different species, you'd have half a dozen different phyla. Um, you know, uh, um, leeches, snails, insects, um, flatworms, which were always fascinating how they move along without you know without moving anything, and that's really what kicked me off on freshwater invertebrates. Um, later on, I was amazed to find out that you could actually get a job as a freshwater biologist working with the, with the water company. Um, so when I left school after a gap, I uh, went to Central London Polytechnic where I was able to essentially undertake a degree which was almost perfect for a freshwater ecologist. I learned basic ecology, but there was an awful lot of uh, freshwater ecology thrown in. And my introduction to the FBA, um, uh, as Louis said, I joined in 1978, and that's um, uh, after I picked up an application form at Ferry House, we um, had an undergraduate field trip to the lakes um, and visited the, uh, the lab at the Ferry House to sort our samples and things. Um, um, yeah, that was my introduction to FBA. I, I knew about FBA slightly before because like a lot of us, I suspect, my very first introduction to FBA was purchasing one of their keys. Um, I wasn't a member, but I got one of the research students at PCL to, um, to buy me this uh, uh, key that I still have and I still use uh, and it's pretty well thumbed through. Then later on, on I did an MSc at Chelsea College and again, we visited the ferry house uh, and did a, um, uh, um, a field trip uh, based, at, based from ferry house. Um, so I think my point here is thinking about, you know, the way we encourage new members, it's really important to get people young because I, I've been a member for a few years now. Um, and the importance of these courses and things, introducing people to the FBA. Um, I'll skip that slide. Um, 
later on, I undertook a PhD, after the MSc, I undertook a PhD funded by British Petroleum and based in Shropshire at a Field Studies Centre, Preston Montford. And I was looking at um, the ecology of deep lowland rivers, British Petroleum discharged into European rivers that were quite large and they were quite difficult to sample. So I was looking at uh, comparing different sampling techniques as well as how you'd use invertebrates, you know, the looking at indices. And the very first thing I did when I started this PhD was go up to Ferry House and talk to Malcolm Elliott, who'd just been investigating methods for deep water sampling uh, and chose the, the Ponar grab thanks to Malcolm and also artificial substrates, which were being developed by uh, Bert Hawkes and his team at Aston. Um, Bert Hawkes, my supervisor, had just finished uh, work on the BMWP score system, which um, featured strongly in my later, uh, all through the rest of my career, really. Um, so one of the reasons, one of the things that Bert Hawkes was interested in were some of the gaps in the River Communities project, which led to RIVPAX. RIVPAX was developed by the River Community team down at the River Lab, uh, and they started I, um, about the time I was starting my first degree, so I think it was around 70, 1977, I think, the, uh, the, the, the first contract for that um, River Community project. And basically what the team did was look for um, essentially natural, unpolluted rivers and sample their invertebrates. And they were investigating whether um, each river had its own unique fauna or whether the, um, the invertebrate communities weren't unique to different rivers, but depended on the environmental characteristics. And the upshot was that um, the uh, communities depended on the on a few physical chemical variables, the characteristics of the stream, and that similar stream um, community types could be found in rivers where you know across the UK. Um, uh, so that enabled them to build a model, uh, reversing their study. Um, uh, and, and put that into some software where you could, if you input the environmental characteristics, RIVPAX would predict the uh, invertebrate community, the, the species and their probabilities of occurrence. Um, they also looked at the abundances of families uh, and um, if you could do that, you can predict a biotic index. Um, so that's the basis of RIVPAX and um, why do we why do we still use this tool? Well, I work in the Environment Agency, and uh, we're always we use biological uh, monitoring to assess the quality of rivers, and we do that with these biotic indices. And they basically are biotic index is a number that relates to the sensitivity of the different um, invertebrates that, that that we find. Um, the problem is that um, these um, uh, indices not only vary because of uh, environmental pressures, but they also vary because of the differences in the uh, in the natural communities you find and the the natural environmental pressures. So I've got two indices that we use commonly at the moment. Um, uh, um, ASPT, which is the average sensitivity essentially to oxygen and organics and, and, and silt and things, um, the impact of sewage. And we also have the number of tax of the number of different families. And we see in the, uh, in the chalk stream, we find that the ASPT is around four and the tax on there are about 40 different families. In the small mountain stream, which is probably of equivalent quality, we find um, that the sensitivity to organic pollution or oxygen and things, the, the ASPT is almost twice as big, at around seven. This is because there is constantly high level of oxygen in this stream, very low productivity. So you don't get an oxygen sag at night, which you would in the chalk stream, which I've made a bit greener than it really is. But just to stress, you know, that is chock full of macrophytes and such like. Uh, also, the, however, the number of taxa in the chalk stream 
is about twice what it is in the mountains, in, in the small mountain stream. This is because the small mountain stream is quite a stressful environment physically. There's not a great deal of productivity, so there's not a great deal of food. You're, you're having to deal with a very harsh environment. So how do we use RIV packs We're to, uh, in our assessments of ecological quality? We, we have this problem that we can't use indices on their own because they respond not only to environmental pressures because of man, but also the natural environmental pressures. Well, RIV packs will predict what we would expect to find in a river if it was in essentially good nick. So if we know the uh, if we know what animals we we are likely to find we can calculate the values of the indices that we're likely to find in these types in different types of rivers under essentially good conditions compared with what we actually find if we find we've only got you know half the number of taxa that rift packs predicts we know there's probably a problem and, and, and whether there's half the you know so whether that's in the mountain stream we only find 10 or in the chalk stream, we only find 20. We know that we've only got half as many as we should have so that we can see the impact. And the same with the ASPT. So we, we, um, uh, we use RIF packs to express our biotic indices as proportions of, the, uh, of what we would expect them to be. Um, and that made the National River Quality Surveys uh, when we displayed the results of the biological um, surveys, uh, it enabled us to essentially devise a classification and color maps that related to environmental pressure and not just the, the, natural, um, the, the natural conditions. And in the 1980 national survey, they produced a map of the country and they, used, they devised the, the BMWP score system, which was a sensitivity to sewage um, uh, inputs essentially and um, you know on the map it wasn't colored there was no classification they could just simply put the BMWP number and so you ended up with lots of numbers over the map and it was impossible to say whether you know whether that number indicated good quality or, or poor quality unless you understood the the rivers so this software um, uh, the the RIFPAX model and the software that um, that's implemented in originally it was written for the BBC Micro and um, Patrick Armitage sent me these um, these slides uh, and looking identifying the computer gear we were able to work out which um, which version of RIFPAX we are looking at but so the first photograph on on the left there with the BBC Micro was the first version of RIFPAX that was developed into RIFPAX on IBM PCs in, in the 19, uh, for, the, uh, for the 1990 National Survey. That coincided with the uh, establishment of the National Rivers Authority and the beginning of the National Rivers Authority's um, research program developing RIVPAX, uh, which continues today. Um, uh, in the mid 90s, we developed a new version of RIVPAX, RIVPAX 3. We give a different number to RIVPAX every time we change the reference data set. So RIVPAX 3 had far more um, uh, reference sites in it, from, uh, particularly from headwater streams. And the plus um, modules were added for highlands and islands. Um, um, so, and the development of, of RIVPAX continued through to around 2005. Um, about the same time, where, or certainly with the, when we came to the 1990 National Survey, we realized we were worried about how well our, uh, the NRA's biology labs, how accurately they were able to sort samples. So we started to check and we got the river community team, uh, the river lab, to reanalyze um, a, a number of samples from each of our laboratories. And when we looked at the results the very first time we were audited i think we were quite amazed how poor some of the uh, the, the quality of some of the labs was way back in 1990 um, but very quickly um, once they realized they were being audited and also um, to have someone able to point out to an analyst that they're missing you know this particular caddis fly all the time or, or you know it's not until somebody 
uh, tells you that you're missing things that you know you're missing something when you're when you're sorting. Um, so we realized that the, uh, the these audit results, the changes in our analytical quality accounted for about 50% of the improvements we saw in biological quality between the 1990 and the 1995 national survey. And that made us realize we needed to take into account this error um, because the error is biased. And that is because it's you're much more likely to record fewer taxa than you are to record more taxa. The only way you can record a taxon that's not there is a misidentification, which probably means that you're not recording one family, but you're recording another family instead. So if you take these, uh, uh, you know, these changes in analytical quality into account, they can actually mask the signal from the biotic indices. So from 1995, we started to take bias into account, essentially adding the number of some average number of samples missed um, to the number that the biologist recorded in terms of number of taxa. Errors in, in the average score for tax on this sensitivity to organic pollution tended to be more random uh, and much smaller. So then came along Water Framework Directive. Um, uh, and uh, we had worked on this um, for some time before the framework directive came into force, originally as an ecology directive. And I think almost the second thing I did when I joined the NRA was to go to a conference in Brussels organized by Roger Sweeting and a couple of others uh, in, to introduce the Europeans to our concept of biological monitoring and to try and infuse them into uh, into into backing this this proposal for a new in, uh, for a new directive and also to share information about how we went about um, uh, evaluating biological quality in rivers so anyway the the water framework directive it's a, it, it's a fantastic bit of legislation in my view um, it's overarching it it it, um, it, it doesn't just talk about how we, uh, the, the biological classifications and things, it actually um, is far more integrating it. Um, I, in fact, I'll put, the, I'll put the next, go straight to the next slide actually, because um, this in a nutshell is water framework directive. Um, it specifies the organization you need to manage um, um, surface water and groundwater quality. Um, Organizing, uh, organizing it into river basins, and you have this cycle of management activity. Um, characterizing um, uh, uh, characterization there is uh, is describing what's going on in in the, in the river catchment, what the activities are, what the um, you know where the um, uh, what the ge geology is, the geography, uh, which leads to identifying the significant water management issues which are essentially where are the main pressures on, on the environment. Um, we set environmental objectives, um, and these are based on our classification scheme. So the, the, the objective everybody knows is we should achieve good quality by whatever date. Um, where we, we go out and we undertake monitoring, where we find that our from monitoring, we're not achieving those environmental objectives, then we have to put in place a program of measures to uh, restore quality to meet the environmental objectives. And that work goes into the next river basin management plan. And this whole thing cycles every six years. Um, so I mentioned that the Water Framework Directive originated in the Ecology Directive. And uh, at that time, we um, in the uh, certainly through the 1990s, we defined river quality in terms of chemistry. So the national uh, surveys, we had a classification based on uh, oxygen, um, BOD, ammonia, um, and the whole of the management was was really centered around the the chemistry. And it took a lot of convincing to. Uh, to um, get our senior managers to accept that biological monitoring was the way forward. Because really, what are we trying to protect? 
What do we mean by environmental quality? Well, we need enough water in the river, so there's a physical resource. Um, we don't want dangerous chemicals in there that are toxic to humans, so, that, so there's a, a health thing. But the main thing is uh, that we have a functioning ecosystem, and an ecosystem is driven by the biology. So the biology really is central to the way we define environmental quality. Uh, and Water Framework Directive specified we uh, taking very much from the approach we used in the UK with RIV packs, comparing what we actually find in terms of the biotic index with this reference state, which is very much like the RIV packs prediction, uh, only a little, maybe a little bit more precisely defined. The other thing is that um, uh, they wanted us to take into account errors um, because um, uh, biological uh, surveying is imprecise and so there is some uncertainty around the, the results. So now under Water Framework Directive, whenever you see a river is class A, you know that it's not class A. Uh, the most probable class is A, but it may be B, C, D or E. So, um, uh, so that is really important when we're trying to look at the difference in quality, changes in quality, we need to take into account the uncertainty. So here is the, uh, the classification required by Water Framework Directive, and it involves a range of biological elements, not just invertebrates, but macrophytes, diatoms, fish, phytoplankton, uh, as well as some physical chemical elements. These are, we call them supporting elements, oxygen, uh, temperature, pH, alkalinity. The, these, thing, these are the things that are required to support the ecology. And there are also some hydromorphological elements. So the morphology's got to be uh, got to be good, and the um, uh, as has the the flow. And there are also some 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 chemicals in there as well. But to 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 produce this classification, you need for the biologists, we needed to develop classifications meeting the requirements of the directive for for diatoms, plants, fish, um, for for all the biological elements. So there was a lot of planning went into uh, gearing up for Water Framework Directive, and I show these because they have sp specific reference to FBA. Um, the, uh, the, the first photograph on the left, top left, is at the River Lab. That's the fish pass. I think Roger Sweeting is a dot in there. Um, and this was the, the team in, in the NR, uh, NRA or Environment Agency by then uh, developed some of the classification tools. Below that is another board member, Richard Chad and John Steele, uh, developing the databases that were needed to support uh, Water Framework Directive. And then on the on the right, a couple of views from the from the uh, uh, Windermere Lab, a meeting uh, with Roger Sweeting, myself, uh, Mike Furs from the River Lab, um, uh, Paul Logan, and um, Peter Hale from Northern Ireland. But we quite often ended up having strategic meetings trying to work out how to uh, how to deal with the water framework directive and the bottom picture there shows Mike Furs in the in the ferry house. Uh, so an, another strong FBA link to the or at least river community team link at the river lab to water framework directive were the star and ACM projects and, and other projects. European Union funded projects to enable different member states to actually implement the directive. Uh, Mike first and I were asked to, to join as project external advisors on the ACM project, which was uh, um, uh, the main outcome I think from ACM was to get certainly central Northern European countries to devise the method they would use certainly for invertebrates. Uh, and we undertook um, uh, the beginning of the STAR project, which Mike Furs was the project leader for. Um, uh, the first thing we did was, was go out on uh, at, uh, the, the bottom uh, left-hand photograph there with John David Bowker and I think uh, Mike Furs in the background, uh, showing um, uh, uh, partners from different countries how to collect invertebrate samples. And we also um, uh, looked at RHS and the diatom macrophyte methods as well. Um, uh, the other 
uh, outcome from the STAR project. By the way, we visited a number of different countries. So the, um, the sampling um, uh, uh, um, workshop happened in France. Uh, the photograph top right is in Sweden and Mike Furs uh, trying to call us all to order. Uh, one of the things that developed from STAR was the how we deal with intercalibration. Intercalibration basically is how do we make sure that the classifications used in different countries are equivalent. So good quality in Germany by the German method is the same as good quality in England or France or Spain. Uh, and a small group of us um, uh, uh, devised a, an approach for intercalibration because they, the, the, the approach actually written in the directive <laughs> was unworkable. Um, so we had to make some changes to RIV packs to make it compatible with the with the water framework directive. And one of the main things, apart from in, incorporating a, a probabilistic classification, taking into account the errors, uh, was to um, uh, alter the RIV packs prediction to a prediction of reference. And reference um, reference state is, is a near natural state, not completely without human intervention. But I think people had in mind pre-agricultural revolution, pre-industrial revolution for, for toxics. And it was more precise. It was somewhere in high status. So the first thing we had to do with RIV packs was to ensure that the predictions in any river type related to the same quality. So the first thing I did, we, we did was to adjust them so the predictions were for uh, you know, prediction of an index at the, at the high good boundary, because that was the easiest place to, to predict, and then to adjust it to somewhere in high. Um, uh, based on a definition of reference, we were supposed to identify reference sites and the average uh, um, index value at sites that we are in reference was supposed to be the definition of, re of reference uh, for an index. Um, so we had to uh, modify um, RIV packs and we had a project to do that um, and then to produce the RIC software. And so on the left, um, by uh, in 2005, we set up um, or devised the project uh, that, that ended up uh, producing RIC um, and implementing RIV packs for. And we did that in the, in the river laboratory, this, this meeting in the meeting room in the river lab. Uh, at that time, the river community team had decamped to Winfrit um, uh, in the CH laboratory um, there. So the, the river lab was quite bare at that time. Anyway, we produced new software uh, in this project um, and the final meeting there in 2008. So it's sometime around then that we launched this uh, as a web app, uh, implementing RIVPAX 4, which had the WFD classification um, RIV packs for um, probabilistic um, classification and such like. Um, but we were still using BMWP. So shortly or, or around the same time, we were revising the BMWP score uh, index system that we used in the classification in UK. BMWP was a, a biological monitoring working party. I don't know how good their parties were, but it was a working party, a group of experts that um, uh, that when they devised the BMWP score indices, uh, got round a table, had a list of families, and agreed amongst themselves the sensitivity of each family on a on a scale of one to ten. Um, but um, by you know by by around two thousand, we'd had um, uh, ten years of collecting invertebrates in a consistent way using the RIVPAX method, quality assured by auditing and, and, and training. Um, we were able to, to essentially rescale, check the BMWP scores for each families by using this database of 100,000 samples. So it's a pretty large database. And we we also took into account abundance. We, we always measure, measured abundance on a you know, on a logarithmic, you know, um, one to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, never used it. So we, um, a, a water framework directive required us to take abundance into account. So we, we took abundance into account in this revised index by giving a different sensitivity score 
to each family based on its abundance. And so for some um, tolerant taxa, uh, a greater abundance represented poorer quality, and for others, sensitive taxa, greater abundance meant um, much better quality. And we, we stuck to the same one to 10 scale, but that one to 10 scale, we extended it at either end because of the way the distributions, uh, you know, the distributions we found. So we've got a Celida there scoring minus six and heptagenids at abundance level four scoring more than 10. Uh, and for any index value, we only used an index value if it was based on at least 75 records. So we also updated the taxonomy, we were recording more, more families. And, and that new index, uh, particularly as an ASPT, gave us much more uh, uh, sensitivity to pressures. It enabled us to, to detect change um, in abundances, which tend to happen before you end up getting a change in, in, in species composition. Much more sensitive around that good moderate boundary, which is critical to water framework directive. And below is, is, is Bill Wally, who developed it, Bert Hawkes, who is the, um, uh, the H in WHPT, um, uh, um, Martin Paisley and, and Dave Trigger, the other two initials in WHPT. So we devised a new version of RIF packs uh, uh, or, or new software uh, to cope with this WHPT index. And there were some fundamental changes that, that, that uh, that we made, or, or when I say we, this was the what was left of the river community team um, at uh, down at the river lab. So um, uh, we had to riff packs could predict abundance categories for families, but we needed to get riff uh, packs to predict numerical abundances, and that required going back to the original lab notebooks uh, for riff packs, uh, which were in storage at the time. And, we found that most of the people in the laboratory, they didn't just record the abundance categories to work out the abundance category, they, 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 they did counts. So we were able to pick up numerical abundances. We had a new method of combining seasons because it's impossible to, in the old days, we used to pool the samples, so add the spring and the autumn samples together. But if, you, if you're taking abundance into account, your abundances all increase and therefore you're indicating different quality. So we, need, we, we ended up having to take an average and we made some other minor adjustments. Um, so, we, th so that was where we were um, with Water Framework Directive and RICT. Um, the same time there was more other research going on um, down at the River Lab, particularly with, um, with John Davy Bowker leading and, Mike, uh, and um, Ralph Clark, Mike retired as did John Wright. Um, and so it's only relatively recently that we've refined the deep water sampling methods. Um, uh, and we, we've come up with an airlift sampler, which is I didn't use when I had a PhD, although Malcolm Elliott had been evaluating them because quite frankly, they were cumbersome and dangerous. So we've developed a new, um, a, a new very simple airlift, which is basically a tube um, we use much lower pressure air pressure, so it's a lot safer. And the latest version is the silver one in the middle there, which is made out of um, exhaust pipe for lorries. So it's aluminium, it's very light and easy to control. And uh, John and Ralph did some uh, evaluations, uh, a number of projects in, in England and Ireland, evaluating different methods. And we, we've come up with um, a much better way of deciding what method we use depending on the width and depth of the river. The other thing that we've developed is a new RIVPAX model, or when I say we again, this is mainly Ralph Clark with help from John uh, down at the River Lab, replacing width, depth and substrate by some uh, variables that you can get from GIS. The problem with width, depth and substrate is um, that these are all impacted by, um, uh, by abstractions, discharges, and physical modification. Um, our view on quality since RIFPAX was developed in, uh, you know, in the early, at the end of the 1970s, beginning of the 80s, has changed. In those days, 
river quality was made uh, was largely sewage and industrial pollution um since then we've you know every town every building has to be connected to sewage to some sort of sewage treatment we've built masses of sewage works um uh, uh we've uh, we've reduced our heavy industry which has helped so water quality isn't the issue it used to be and um, water quality is much better than it used to be um and only last night i was thinking back you know when i started when i finished my phd i was teaching at uh, sunderland poly and at the field center and it was very easy to do a practical for students to show them the impact of sewage you'd go to a you know a sewage outfall and you'd be able to see an oxygen sag and coronamids and ligakeet zone and a recovery zone and you don't see that now what we see our impact we now see much more clearly the impacts of abstraction and the impacts of physical modification and virtually all our rivers have been modified physically for to improve drainage and that's a major problem now because of flooding and uh, uh, and the water resource pressure. So by taking out width, depth and substrate um, from our predictive model, it should enable us to get a prediction of what they, you know, uh, get a more realistic prediction of what the fauna should be. So we've used geology and catchment size, which we get from GIS, which aren't, um, which aren't, uh, uh, sensitive to, to these artificial pressures. However, we've got to test this new model now because the substrate is a really strong predictor of the invertebrate community. So by taking out substrate and, and, the, and the dimensions of the river, we think the predictive power of model 44 will be reduced as a result. But So whether we end up with a better, better model or not, we need to investigate. The only way to do that is to actually implement it into into RICT, into the software. So we had a project to produce RICT, uh, a new version of RICT, so that we could incorporate uh, this Model 44, so that we could test it. At the same time, we, we, we resolved another number of other issues, but basically this is the a graphical user interface to make it easier written in R, which ecologists understand, and it's all available on the FBA website, uh, and it went live on the FBA website in, um, uh, in April. Um, uh, so as well as access to the, to, to the to, to RIFPAX, the software, um, we, you can, uh, there is the RIFPAX database that you can download, all the, uh, the RIFPAX guidance, how to use it. There are videos showing you how to use the software. Um, and there are some research reports. Eventually, uh, it was stopped because of COVID-19, but uh, we'd like to get all the references, all the grey literature related to RIFPACs up on this website. And there's also a link to the training courses, which, um, which uh, FBA run a number of training courses on RIFPACs um, uh, each year. So, so why did we produce a new version of RICT? Well, there's Model 44, but the other thing was the uh, the old RICT was, it used to take ages to run a classification. For a national classification, it used to take the Environment Agency, um, uh, you know, a couple of weeks. It was so long that if we found an error in the classification, we were not able to go back and rerun it. And there are always errors and mistakes. So um, we needed to, to speed it up. Um, uh, we also knew from by uh, some testing that we got John and Ralph at the River Lab to do that there were mistakes in the algorithms within RICT so we needed to correct those. Um, for WFD classification it was using a slightly wrong version of the of the WHPT index for example. Um, we also wanted to open up RICT. Um, RICT was very much a black box which made it very difficult for us to correct the errors we discovered in RICT, but also it, it, it prevented um, uh, external users, universities, uh, researchers from understanding how RICT worked. Um, uh, so we rewriting it in RICT enabled us to make it much more accessible. Uh, here's a picture of the developers, uh, just, just a quick aside. 
we had a number of meetings down at the River Lab. So the River Lab is still Rivpack Central for us. And I think uh, in the last couple of years, I've had more visits to the River Lab than I have, you know, in my, uh, you know, up until now. So we're visiting, you know, every couple of months at least. Um, so the, the new features of RIVPAX, it runs as a, a free web app on, on the Microsoft. You'll need a Microsoft account. Um, it runs on uh, Azure Machine Learning, has this gra graphical interface. But the other thing is that users can download the source code and the internal data. So either they can run it locally or researchers, and we have two PhD students already that have taken RIVPAX and have started to play with the code rebuild the code. One is investing, one is wanting to change all the temperatures to investigate uh, impacts of climate change. Uh, the other was looking at uh, seeing how changes in um, the WHPT, the, the classification, whether when you got an improvement, we got closer or further away from the uh, reference community. Those sort of things are much easier to do if you can take the software code and essentially build your own version of RICT. Uh, so we've got guidance on not only how to use RICT as it is on the, on the web app, but how to how to download the code and how to rebuild it. Um, we updated the RIFPAX database, which John David Bowker maintains. We've added a, a bunch of new indices um, that have been developed um, in recent times, uh, sensitive to um, sediment and drought and such like. And we've incorporated this Model 44. We're not quite there with Model 44 yet, because for Model 44, it's based on GIS data. We got CEH to produce a database with all the GIS data for the whole river network on a 50 meter grid. Um, so it's very important that the grid reference you enter is correct and you end up uh, on the right, you know, pulling data off for the river that you intended. A lot of our monitoring sites are down near the confluence of rivers. So a very small error in grid reference, let alone getting our Eastings and Northings mixed up, uh, can mean you end up on the wrong river. So it's important to be able to uh, check that the grid reference you enter is on the river you intended. And if it's not, to, 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 to move it to, to actually fit onto the, onto the river you want. The other thing is that there are uh, that there are significant error in the um, in the, the river network that CH used to compile the GIS data. So that's seen on this map as, as, a, as a blue line. And this, uh, you can then download from this location checker. Uh, you, you delimit a square on it, and then you can download the GIS data for the, um, for the river lengths within that square. And we're limited to, I think it's to nine, uh, to one location and nine rows of data purely because of the restriction CH have put on licensing. They don't want people to, to reverse engineer the, 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 the intelligent river network. However, you know, if you sit, if you've got a lifetime to spend, you can just simply um, uh, extract data for each 50 meter grid square. You know, the number of times you extract data is not a problem. So where do we go in the future with RIVPAX? Well, um, there's work to, to maybe incorporate the acidification index, which is used in Scotland um, uh, and in England for investigations. Longer term, RIVPAX is only suitable for rivers that flow constantly. Um, so getting the intermittent streams included uh, is an area of work that will be really useful, particularly in chalk streams. Uh, and uh, and that flows into getting a better, uh, getting better assessment methods for, for headwaters and springs. So that's basically where we're, where we're going with RIVPAX. The, the, uh, the, the River Lab is still very much the center of, um, uh, of, of RIVPAX and still very active. Ralph Clark has retired now, so John Davy Bowker, um, who's one of the fellows, I think is is the last active member, but we um, we're not letting Ralph retire. Basically, um, on to some other things. Thinking of the future, I've been working on the Upper Hampshire Avon, and it's made me think about what it is we're doing, uh, in a number of things. One is I wonder whether our uh, invertebrate classification 
matches or is out of step with the macrophyte classification. Um, and in the bottom left there, I show a diagram out by Sladacek from the 1970s, looking at saprobity. Basically, you've got a scale from top right where you have raw sewage down to almost pure H2O uh, at the bottom there, and, and just mapping where the invertebrates are found and where the plants are found. Uh, and invertebrates, you, you know, plants will, you, you won't find so many plants where the water is so turbid that light can't get through. Uh, on the other hand, you can still find invertebrates, macroinvertebrates, you know, the the the, the, the and coronamid zone. Um, so they extend into bad quality further invertebrates, but I think plants maybe extend a bit further into the into the sort of very oligotrophic, ultra oligotrophic water. So it makes me wonder whether the uh, whether the classification schemes um, uh, are equivalent, and we discuss display them as I've got just below the heading on the same scale, whether they are indeed on the same scale. The other thing I've been wondering about are multiple pressures. And um, underwater framework directive, we're supposed to, uh, um, when we, the first thing we do in a program of measures when we don't meet our objectives is to identify the pressure that is causing the failure uh, and then Having, I, I think I might have this on the next uh, on the next slide. Yeah, you identify that we have this DPSIR. Uh, work out what's driving, what the pressure is. Work out the state, the impact, and the result. The result being the program of measures. So, where you've got multiple pressures, identifying what the pressure is is probably nonsensical because multiple pressures happen together. And this diagram that uh, I got from Paul Logan produced way back when we were planning water framework directive encompassed that, that ecological quality in a river depends on the water quality, on the physical structure and the quantity of water. Um, and these pressures work together. So you, uh, and we can mitigate, you know, on the water framework directive model, you identify the pressure that's causing the failure. But here we see, you know, it's one, it's never one pressure, uh, unless that pressure is really severe. So we can, we can solve, we can mitigate a, a quantity problem by improving the quality or the structure, totally unrelated pressures. And I think that might have happened to some extent in the, uh, on the uh, Hampshire Avon. I was amazed going downstream of the sewage effluent. I couldn't, for Amesbury, I couldn't see where the effluent came in unless somebody told me there was an effluent there. I wouldn't have known. Um, and I, uh, we know there's flow pressure on the Avon, um, but there's constantly improving water quality. Phosphorus standards are, are getting tighter and tighter. Uh, and I think that we are, to some extent, mitigating the pressure from quality and to some extent structure. You know, we've got fields going right up to the riverbank um, uh, and uh, in the suburban areas, gardens going right up to the riverbank. We don't have a natural, you know, as you see in this photograph here, which is owned by the, the Salisbury District Angling Club, encouraging trees, believe it or not, because people want to go and, you know, fish in a nice environment. You know, I, I think we, we, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's not as much water as there used to be in the, in, in the river. Yet the, the WFD classification, apart from nutrients, is coming out reasonably good. The angling clubs jumping up and down because, you know, the river fails on phosphorus and they're worried about peaks of phosphorus. Um, uh, I actually think they probably want more phosphorus in the river so that it uh, maintains its productivity. Uh, salmon and trout conservation think there should be a minimum of 500 gammaus and 500 um, uh, serratella in a sample if, if it's in good nick. Well, that for me, 500 gammaus in a rib pack sample means you know it's getting quite enriched. So they want high productivity. What they don't want is low oxygen at night. They don't want siltation. So the way you can control that is if you control the flow and improve the uh, and improve the the, the structure you're able to increase the phosphorus, increase productivity without getting those, 
you know, water quality problems. Anyway, that's that's conjecture. I've not spoken to the Anglican Club about that because it's probably quite political suggesting we change the, the, the nutrient standards. And I, I'm not sure that the nutrient standards are wrong or are right. I'm not sure whether that our classifications are in line or not, the invertebrates and the plants. But it's something that I think we need to, to investigate. And the other thing I've been thinking of is how we measure long-term change. Um, uh, just recently, we, we, a number of things have come up in the press. James Bevan saying he thinks that we need to alter WFD, make changes. Uh, the um, the nine, 2019 classification came out and I think all our, virtually all our rivers failed to achieve good quality uh, under WFD. Um, and what does that mean? Well, for me, I think that there's a difference between the, I don't think the WFD status classification, I think it's brilliant for management um, because it identifies where we need to go and do something. Um, uh, the first thing we do is, you know, is there a, is this a statistical problem or is it a real problem? If it's a real problem, put it right. Um, but, the, you know, the more, uh, there's an increasing number of parameters that we use for, for, for overall status. And you only need one parameter to fail and the water body fails. So the chances of um, a, just on statistics, uh, of getting a failure increase dramatically. Um, uh, and that really, so that state, you know, I think if we, if we did achieve good status for all our rivers as, uh, as people want, I would be really worried because it basically is the environment agency saying we don't think we need to go and do anything anymore. And we know it can't be right, basically for statistical reasons, you know, because of the errors. What WFD classification is not good at is enabling us to say, has water quality improved? And I think we need to think about how we monitor the state of the environment. Um, a, a number of bits of work have indicated that maybe there'd have been improvements. Work from, from Steve, who's just disappeared, um, uh, at Cardiff, showing changes up to uh, between 1990 and 20, 2012. Um, there's evidence that there have been other improvements, but we can't really see that in our data. We've changed the way we classify, we've changed the way we monitor. Um, uh, so yeah, these are things I think we need to think about for the future. And I think I'll probably stop there. Um, uh, our hour's nearly up and um, yeah. So if there's any questions or anything, I don't know how I hand back over to, to Louise. So I'm going to stop sharing, yes? Can you? Right, I need to see if I can. Um, I don't know. Hi, John. I'm back. Hi, John. <laughs> Thank you. That was a brilliant talk. I'm going to um, now unmute everybody um, in case anybody has any specific questions. Um, here we go. I think you should all be able to unmute yourselves now if you if you want to. There we go. Yes, unfortunately, we, I don't think we can unmute everybody centrally, which is a shame. I think I can ask people to unmute, but they need to actually physically do it themselves. Um, that was a brilliant talk. We had uh, we had a few comments in the in the chat box actually whilst you were talking. Some really uh, funny ones. Uh, one from Martin Kelly saying that he remembers um, one of the. Uh, the final dinner on the Star Project meeting in France was the only time he's ever eaten at a restaurant with three Michelin stars. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. The only time I've ever eaten in a, in a umpteen star uh, restaurant as well. Um, we used to have budgets in those days. <laughs> I don't know what a budget is these days, but uh, we don't, you know, we're lucky if we're, well, we can't even afford McDonald's, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> that was really excellent. Does anybody have any questions for... For John, before we wrap up, 
I could ask a question. I enjoyed the talk very much, uh, John, Stephen, Mabley here. I've often wondered who or what teams actually produce the Water Framework Directive. Do you know who, how that was actually produced? Well, I think you should ask Roger because Roger was involved in the in, in setting up the the ecology directive and the and the water framework directive. But there was a pretty large group of people, um, experts and 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 um, technocrats. Um, Were they based in Brussels or was... uh, based in based in Brussels? But a, a lot of the biological. You know the biological methods were de devised by you know, each country devised their own method. We came together on intercalibration, so that was done by groups of experts um, from each member state, coordinated by um, the Joint Research Centre at ISPRA, Milan, the the European Union Research Centre. Um, but because Water Framework Directive is such an you know it covers public participation, charging for, you know, polluter pays, um, uh, you know, the organizational structure that, you know, I've been involved in projects to in help member states, uh, accession states join the European Union. They have to, um, they have to comply with all our legislation. And I think the two main bits of legislation are uh, there's competition rules, the environment rules and the human rights rules. They're the biggest. So environment and a water framework directive on the environment is one of the biggest and most complex. Mm. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a combination of technocrats from uh, experts from member states and uh, at DG11, uh, the environment. Thank you. Uh, and a number of people on the call were the expert. I see Jeff Phillips there and Martin Kelly, Roger Sweeting, you know. <laughs> It's quite a, quite a number. Steve, were you going to ask a question there? Yeah, if I can. I mean, John, that was fantastic historical perspective around the development of rift pikes, rigged the application. The pressure now in the regulatory sector is about reducing sampling, and yep. that's across the board, NRW, SEPA, Environment Agency. And it's also very much around a potential move towards completely new methods. So DNA-based methods, remote sensing methods, I think are a position we will be pushed to move into essentially for cost effectiveness. What, what's the future of RICT and rift packs in that, in that new uh, altered methodological future? Well, I think it has a good future, I think inver invertebrates are relatively easy to identify. Um, the expensive part is going out and collecting the sample. The laboratory analysis, you know, it's uh, compared with with, um, with with other taxa, it's relatively easy to do. Where I see us going with DNA is not trying to replicate the methods we've already got, but using DNA for the things that it's good at. Um, so. The things that we're really bad at are the microbial communities that drive the ecosystem. And DNA is pretty damn good at microbial identification. Um, and I think, you know, whenever you get a new technology, things come out of the woodwork that you didn't expect. So the huge advance that COVID-19 has given us, they've used the DNA method for tracking COVID-19 in, in sewage effluent. And we've never thought about, you know, using our environmental monitoring for tracking human diseases, human health. There's a completely new way of using, you know, a, a complete, completely new reason for going out and monitoring, you know, downstream of sewage works. The other thing DNA has done that other things can't do is identifying the presence of um, invasive species or very rare species um, in a way that, you know, you, we can only identify them if we actually find them. But you can trace, um, you know, you can trace DNA in, in, from a water sample. You can, you know, that helps us to protect in ways we weren't able to do. So I think that's where DNA is going. I think the technology, you know, uh, uh, matching different data sets together, um, large data analysis is a way to go. But I do think we've lost something. I, I can't see us ever not using invertebrates the way we do because a biologist just needs 
Pondnet is pretty cheap. Uh, and a biologist, okay, it's expensive, but you know, you, a biologist can go to a river, put the pond net in a river and look at what they find and pretty quickly say, oh, that's polluted, that's not right. Um, so it's quite a, it's a good method and, and they respond to so many um, pressures. But I think, you know, remote sensing, uh, DNA analysis, you know, they, they will come in as well. Could I, could I just add something in there, John? I think the other thing that's really coming to the fore, Steve, is, as you know, is, is use of citizen scientists and, and things like the River Fly Network um, and others um, where, OK, it's not at the same level, but it's, it's a monitoring network where you're filling in gaps um, and, and providing, providing things that, you know, don't necessarily get picked up with the reduction in the, in the national networks as they're happening, as you say, which are becoming far more responsive to detect changes. Um, yeah, yeah, so I think that's probably useful. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Um, although, in, interestingly, my experience with, with getting a bit involved in river fly network locally on River Wensum is that the people there find it very difficult to understand the Water Framework Directive system which i don't think any of us would be surprised at um uh, and also that the, the, uh, the sort of biological classification that the agency does seems to be out of step with what riverfly appears to tell them um and i've been struggling along with david harper who's not here is he actually to try and sort of a educate the uh, everybody and begin to understand what those differences actually are um and i think you know, I mean, rift packs. It, it's interesting that you can you could use rift packs online because you know it, it's always been an invisible black box that I, as far as I could see. Um, and I think rift packs has got potential, but the problem with Riverfly is that of course it's a very limited taxonomic resolution. Although I think that some of the people we've got working who are now spending time with us learning to identify stuff could could well do a lot a lot more. So I think you know. There are there are some opportunities there, but but river fly is quite accurate. Um, you only need to to look at a few indicators. You know, have you got acellus? Have you got mayflies? Have you got stoneflies? Have you just got coronamids? You know, it's a pretty strong indicator, if imprecise. So um, yeah, but it, I mean, the sort of yeah, the the sort of messages that people are picking up, the the, the anglers who are doing river fly are saying the river Wensum is terrible. Um, <laughs> And WFD classification, I think, is high status for, for invertebrates, at least. Yes. And yes. There's a big mismatch there. Uh, and there is on the Hampshire Raven that I'm looking at. I think the other thing is, Jeff, as you probably know, there's been some further developments with, with um, river flies. So there's now an extended scheme which looks at far more taxa, which gives you a lot more capacity to look at different pressures like silt and flow. Um, so those are being rolled out at the moment. And uh, the other thing we've been doing at the FBA um, is to work on providing some, some things within the website that, um, that sort of try and help provide information to, to the volunteers to actually understand more about what the pressures are within their catchment. So, you know, so they can start looking not just at the data they're collecting, but other data that's available to help them understand what's going on within their bit of river. So I think that, you know, it's, it's all part of the process of people want to know more um, and sort of get more knowledge and experience of what's going on. So it's, it's, it's a long job, but it's an interesting thing that's happening. I think it also highlights to me that I think possibly one of the things the FBA should think more about, or us as fellows should think more about is, is trying to demystify the Water Framework Directive. I mean, it, you know, it, yeah. in its sort of overall form, it's very simple. You know, a river is either good or it's not good. And everybody gets very wound up because their river isn't good. If they understood the things that contribute to that, they begin to realise why it's very likely there'll never ever be anything other than not good. I mean, it's sort of, it's such a complex thing. I think most of us have spent a long time with this directive and we, we understand it reasonably well and can see your way through it. But most people, it's completely un, uninterpretable. We need the Ladybird book of... of 
But, because, yeah, I mean, the, the anglers that, that I'm dealing with, they get really, they think we're, we're trying to pull the wool over their eyes by not classifying on the phosphorus peaks, you know, uh, and just that, com you know, complete, yeah, the lack of understanding of how rivers work and, and you know, how chemistry works and the biology and things. And it needs to be very simple. More emphasis on the, on narrative standards, or at least translating the status mm -hmm. classes into something that people can visualise. I think yes. the Lake Macrobite people, in particular, did a really good job of that, of sort of conjuring up through their work a sort of a, an image of what they should be aiming for. But, um, for most of the other quality elements, we're not so good. I mean, if we could define good ecological status, from my point of view, as sort of low quantities of filamentous algae, that would make a lot more sense to the man in the street than sort of a list of Latin names of diatoms, for example. Well, I, I also think the other thing that's emerging to me over various things I've been doing since I left the agency is that I do think there's a pretty big, well, not big, but there's a mismatch between the boundaries, between the different um, quality elements. I don't really feel that the that the invertebrates, the macrophytes, the phylobenthos, I mean, they were all intercalibrated across Europe, but they were actually intercalibrated between each other. And I think there's some, probably some issues there that somebody needs to look at one day, but. Mm. It was an excellent talk though, John, quite thought provoking. Okay. <laughs> Lots of things, cheers. Yeah, I, 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 I'm loath to, to stop the discussions, but I did want to say thank you, John. That was really, really interesting. Um, and it is being recorded. So if anybody didn't catch anything on John's slides, then I will send around the link to the recording over the next couple of days. Um, all that's left to say is uh, the next talk is going to be given by Martin Kelly. Thank you, Martin. Um, he is going to give us his talk uh, entitled Walking with Diatoms on the 28th of October um, at 12 noon again. So um, I'll send out a meeting request shortly for that so that it's in, everybody, in everybody's diaries. Um, so yeah, I hope you will enjoy that. Thank you again, John, that was brilliant. And uh, we will see you in three weeks. Thanks everyone. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.